they stop doing the right thing, if they fall off the wagon, then they lose their status as a Jew. Maybe it doesn't happen right away, but within a generation or two, it's gone. In other words, their Jewishness was defined entirely by their neshama and by their lives. And you should know, or maybe you shouldn't know, but I'm going to tell you anyway, that the consensus is, the primary opinion is, that the Shvatim were not Jews. Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Yitzhak, Zvun, Don, Naftali, God, Asher, Yosef, and Benyamin were Bnei Noach. They were considered sons of Neach. They came from Jews and they weren't Jewish. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons why that can be argued, um, mystical reasons and halachic reasons, but they were not considered Jewish. As far as this conversation is concerned, they didn't have Jewish soul. They didn't have Yiddish and Ishamas. Because somehow having a Jewish soul is something at that time which had to do with a huge personal achievement, and they just didn't achieve it. Simple as that. And the miracle, the, the, the individual about whom this is most profound, is Yosef Atzadik. Because Yosef is considered in some ways greater than the others. They had a din of a Ben Noach, which is why they were able to do things which were against the Torah. Right? We all wonder how Yaakov could have married two wives. Because he was Jews not married two wives. So there's a Ramban who says that the, the Rebbe has a wonderful sikh explaining Rashi's position that Yaakov Avinu only practiced the mitzvahs outside of Israel. In Israel, pardon me. Ramban, as my uncle, my professor uncle says, Ramban was the first Zionist. He, he was in love with Israel, absolutely in love with Eretz Yisrael. The Ramban holds that they practice mitzvahs only in Eretz Yisrael. Yaakov got married in Choron, he was married to two sisters. And he says tragically, as soon as he crossed the border, from Chutzlar, it's Eretz Yisrael, one of his wives died. Imagine that. That's what the Ramban writes. Because in Eretz Yisrael, he had to practice the mitzvahs. The Shvatim didn't, and there's a lot of indications to this effect. Okay? Now, what happens next? What happens next is the Jewish nation goes into Mitzrayim. And they suffer. They suffer terribly. It was a very, very, very miserable and a bitter exile that they experienced. And in the wording of the Rambam, it reached a point where the entire effort and investment of Avraham Avinu was almost erased. It was almost entirely uprooted. Everything of Ramavina tried to do was almost gone. And then Moshe Rabbeinu comes along, takes the Jewish people out of, out of Mitzrayim, which of course is last week's Pasha and this week's Pasha, and the rest is history. So, uh, fine. Fair enough. Very good. Now, so what happened here? And of course the question which really is a rhetoric, you can't answer this question without asking it again, is what kind of game is this? Hashem created a world. And for reasons known only to God, from the outset, from the moment the world was created, He decided He wanted a nation. What that means politically is that God was not about balance. He was about imbalance. God did not create a living being to be 248 heads, or 248 eyes, or 248 arms. You have one head, and you have one heart, and you have one set of lungs, and there's a diversity. There's the right hand and the left hand. So Hashem did not make us to be the same. Hashem made us to be interdependent, but distinct. And part of the plan was it was going to be a nation. And that the nation would start with one person. That was the plan. If I had more time, I can talk to you so much about the story of Eve, the story of Job, as the Gemara explains it, you almost get the impression that Job is a prototype. Job is an experiment. Job was a man. He lived. And he was a pre-Abraham Abraham. That's exactly what he is. Eve was a righteous man, a non-Jew, a prophet, who suffered, tested, just like Abraham was. And the end of the story of Job, as the Gemara says, is Chira, he blasphemes, he fails. If Job succeeds, he's Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu was the successful Job experiment. All the other Job experiments ended in failure. And the way the Gemara tells the story, and again, I'm, I'm spending more time on this than I would like, that the Satan, the Satan, comes to God and says to him, listen to me, God. I know a thing or two. I promise you. There will never be another Abraham. You're never going to test the person the way you tested him, and he will pass. For, don't even try. But the way you read the Gemara, the way the Gemara explains the Job story, how it repeats it, when it happens, the, it, it, uh, Eve is, is an Abraham, I don't know what word you want to use, 
in the testing stages. But the way the Gemara explains the Psukim, the scripture, the book of Job, he fails. Avram succeeds. So why do you go ahead and destroy that? If Avram Avinu is the one human being, right, and it says in the Siddha, we say it every single day in Davening, you find his heart, Ne'emon. Ne'emon is a Hebrew word that's very difficult to translate in English. Loyal, dedicated, singularly committed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, no matter what the cost. You can't break him. God Almighty himself tries to break Avram Avinu <laughs> and fails, if you could say that. Just him ten times. Ten times. And Hashem Kvayachal cannot break Avram Avinu's Amuna. So what are you destroying it? He's a good guy. You take these people, the children of the patriarch, of the nation that you want to be specifically your own, and you put them in hell. You put them in an inferno. You make them impossible for them to hold on to their values and their traditions and their beliefs. In other words, we're going in the position that the children of the Ovis were B'nai Nayach. But B'nai Nayach have serious mitzvahs. Serious mitzvahs. And in Egypt, the Jewish people failed at preserving the seven mitzvahs which were theirs. They all fell into the pagan ways and so on and so forth. Now, so why were the Abish to do this? Why? When you have such a success, would you break it? And of course, the answer to this question is very, very important. So first, I'm going to tell you the point. I'm going to tell you the kernel of the answer, and then I'm going to develop it. The point is that Jewishness from Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yankov, Sada, Rivka, Rach, and Leah, has to do only with the soul, not with the body. What happens when God Almighty gives the title to the Jewish people, and as Rabbi Wilhelm pointed out before, the event of Basi Legani is that this marks a very, very significant additional step in the creation of the Jewish nation. This has to do with the Jewish body, the goof. And the Altarebbe talks about this in Tanya in chapter 49, that when you say Hashem choose, you can't choose between a fresh apple and a rotten apple. You can choose between a fresh apple and a fresh pear or peach or plum. They have to be equal. So if Hashem chose a human being who has a godly soul over a human being that has non-godly soul, it's not a choice. The choice has to be between two equal things. Therefore, the Atav HaChatanu, the choice that HaKadosh Baruch makes in the Jewish people is, is the body. Because there's no difference in a Jewish body and a non-Jewish body. So these are two steps in the birth of the Jewish people. Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yankif, through incredible effort, achieved Jewishness on a spiritual level, and it doesn't last. Their children, the Shvatim, were not B'nai Yisrael, they were B'nai Noach. And then you take this experiment, you take all of this effort, and you put it into Mitzrayim, and you almost erase whatever good was created through the initiative of Ram Avinu. So what is going on? So the, the explanation, which is brought in Rashi, even says in Chumash, this is brought in so many Svarim of Musar of all different types, and certainly Hasidus developed this idea very profoundly, is that the birth of the Jewish nation, the birth of the Jewish people, which is associated with Pesach, which is Yitzhak Mitzrayim, with last week's parasha and this week's parasha, Bashoach um, Paratis. So I, I mentioned that it has to do with the goof, as opposed to the, the goof, as opposed to the neshama. But there's another very, very important factor. And that is God wants a nation. A nation. A nation is not a handful of righteous or virtuous people. A nation are a cross-section. They're a community. And by design, by definition, there's going to be above average, and there's going to be average, and there's going to be below average. As you've all heard the acronym many times before, that the Hebrew word for a minion, the Hebrew word for a community, <coughs> is tzibur. Tzibur, tzibur means a collection. The word tzibur means a collection of different types. And tzibur is an abbreviation for tzaddik, benini, verasha. A community consists of righteous people, that means people who are above average, and average people, and Russia, 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 Russia evil person, the bad person, less than average. You don't have a community unless you have a Russia. You know, the Medrash says, you try this off the size, the Medrash says that of Dawson or Avidam, Dawson and Avidam are the prototypical troublemakers. They're, they're the Jewish Amalekites. They're just bad for the sake of being bad. This is their pleasure. There's order, we got to mess it up. And the Medrash says that if either Dawson or Avida were not present, God does not give the Torah at Mount Sinai. What do you think of that? 
Who needs Das and Right, there's a story with the previous Rebbe. Where the previous Rebbe used to wait for a certain Jew to come. For Shabbos and for Yom Tov. And he used to come on Shabbos with his car. He would drive. Now in 1949, 1948, there was much less tolerance for people who were driving to Shul. And it was, the person doesn't drive, you know, he's not allowed to let him in. And the Rebbe waited for him. I think they used to wait him once for Tekiyas. And the Misnagdim were up in arms. He's waiting for Machal Shabbos. And, and the Rebbe said, in Yiddish, if I state nish my dimension, you don't understand my people. The, the Abish that created different kinds of people. When he created the Jewish nation, he didn't create a nation of tzaddikim. He didn't. He created a nation of God. And the nation of God is like any other nation. There's tzaddikim, there's beninim, and there's reshoyim. They're a community. And there's good, and there's average, and there's below average. And that's the design. Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yankiv, Sada, Rivka, Rachale, in their righteousness, in their virtue, couldn't account for this. They could account for righteousness, they can account for virtue, they could even account for spirituality. But the idea of a goof Kodesh, a Jewish body, Hashem chose the goof of a Jew for no reason other than that he decided to choose. This begins, the birth of the Jewish nation begins after the exile, in the exodus. And the way it's explained is that there was a purging. The Jewish nation were basically erased. You know, the, the famous idea, you want to plant a seed, and something should grow, the seed has to rot first. So what was had to be erased. And when you say what was, you mean Avraham, Yitzchak, Yankif, Sadat, Rifka, Rachaleh has to be erased. Because that was, that was, those were human beings achieving what is the maximum possibility for human being using his or her own effort that had to be erased. And something new was born, a Jewish nation. And the Jewish nation emphatically consists of good ones, average ones, and bad ones. You know that it says in Shulchan Aruch? Look it up. If you, keep it. if you come to shul and there's no Russia, go to a different shul. <laughs> now what do you think of that? <laughs> it says in the prayer of Yom Kippur, there's a special announcement made the night of Yom Kippur, that we permit ourselves to pray with sinners. In, in, those two shul, the small, but it says in Shechon there's got to be all kinds. There's gotta, the Abish there wants all kinds. Why would the Abish make bad people? And of course, the answer is you know the tests of a bad person and you know what a bad person... If you were God, you'd know what God knows and it would make sense. And I got a secret for you. You probably don't want to be as smart as God because you'd be mad. <laughs> Better off ignorant than having too much information. So these are two components of the birth of the Jewish people. If, if my topic is, and this is my topic, what is a Jew? There are two, uh, two poles. The first is the spiritual pole. And this is associated with the Ovis and the Ibois. And then there is the physical pole, the actual reality of a Jew, the goof of Ayid, which is associated with Har Sinai. We became a people, a nation at Har Sinai. This is a really funny concept. Why? Because Yiddishkeit is a religion, right? Yiddishkeit is a way of life. Yiddishkeit has to do with principle. Yiddishkeit has to do with value. Yiddishkeit has a right and a wrong, a good and an evil, a virtuous and a non-virtuous, yes? And it's attributed to a community that must entail transgressors. It's interesting. It's, this is a concept that no human being would conceive of by himself. If you were creating a perfect people, you're going to be your favorite, right? Imagine favoring one child over others, which is in itself frustrating. But if you were to trade a favorite, the favorite would be the best. And the favorite is absolutely not defined by the best. They're descendants of the best, but they're a cross-section. They're a little of this and a little of this and a little of that. And if you were God, you would understand why this is worthwhile, why this is correct. So I want to share with you a, sto a, vart, a story, <laughs> which I think is very, very worthwhile. And I think it, it gets at the heart of this dichotomy that I just presented to you. Um, I mean, most of the people in this room are younger than I am, as I can tell from the fact that you have blacker beards than I do. So uh, I think I'm the youngest person in the room at this particular juncture. Um, <laughs> so, um, so you all remember. You remember the late 80s. You remember the early 90s. You remember the fall of the Soviet Union. And you probably remember how you, you were expecting it to go back south. You couldn't believe that it would actually happen. And then it happened. It was one of the greatest miracles in the history of mankind. We witnessed it. 
it, it, it happened from 85, it happened slowly, and of course in 1991, December 31st, 1991, the Union was officially dissolved. I was in the Ukraine a couple of weeks ago, and the Ukraine is supposed to be under siege in a terrible... It's a modern country with a beautiful airport. The rest stops on the back roads of the Ukraine are as nice as any rest stops you're going to see on the, on the, on the, on the highways of America. Beautiful, well-stocked, with such variety of... The Ukraine I visited 30 years ago was so depressed. And this is not Russia. This is the Ukraine. Russia is, is, is the richest of the 15 states of the former Soviet Union. It's, it's incredible. We witnessed an, a miracle of such proportion that we don't even have the capacity to appreciate how great a miracle it is. But anyway, so during that period of time, a lot of very interesting things happened. And one of them was that they would have uh, radio programs um, that would be intercontinental. Where you would have people speaking from America and people speaking from... I don't know if you remember, there was a very famous broadcast where George Bush and, and um, Mikhail Gorbachev and uh, the third guy, remember him? Come on, Boris Yeltsin. We're on the radio at the same time. Reagan. No, Reagan was already a bottle at this point. This is the 90s. It's not the 80s. Um, they had the radio broadcast. They had a radio. These three men were on the radio at the same time, and everything was being simultaneously into English and to Russian. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. The only thing I remember from that broadcast was they asked each one of these three men if they believe in God. And Gorbachev said, with whatever was left of his Soviet pride, Ya! Yeah. Atheist. <laughs> I am an atheist. And, uh, well, I wonder what he believes today. Or what he believed then, that I'll say today. But that's another story. Mm. And so they had these broadcasts. So there was a regular feature on the radio that I listened to. I was, I think, newly married. I got married in, in the end of 89, 90. There was a man named Vladimir Posner, who was supposedly a Jew. I'm not sure he was Jewish, but he read... Posner, yeah? My great-grandmother's name was also Posner. And... And Phil Donahue, you know the name? Phil, you probably know who Phil Donahue is. And they would do these programs together on American radio. I don't know if this happened on the Russian side. <coughs> Vladimir Posner was born in New York. And in the 1950s, his parents went back to the Promised Land. They went to the utopia of Stalin. You understand? That's, and he spoke English fluently. He was brought up in America. So he was Radio Moscow. He was ready for decades. He was the voice of the Soviet Union to America. Remember, they had the propaganda. So he was the Russian propaganda. He, I've heard interviews of him more recently where he says, I, not a single thing I said back then I believed. Let me tell you, he sounded very convincing. For someone who didn't believe a word he was saying, I think, I, I don't believe him now, I believed him then. But Vladimir Posner, his father is a Jew for sure. I don't know if he was Jewish, but he considers himself a Jew. And they were talking. And the topic of Jew came up, which is like a bad topic, but it came up. And Mr. Posner says, what is a Jew? It's not a religion. I'm an atheist. I'm a Jew. It's not a culture. You have white Jews, and you have black Jews, you have Asian Jews, you have European Jews, you have American Jews, you have Eastern Jews, you have Western Jews. Um, it's not a race. It's not a race. Why? There are all kinds of different Jews. And he went through every delineation. He went through every possible criteria by which you can fix the definition of Jew, and came up empty. And he said, so what's a Jew? It's not a race, it's not a religion, it's not a culture. So what is it? And I, I was young and into it, I'm still into it, but then I was into the politics also. And I remember screaming at my radio. I mean, he hit a home run. Why? Because he articulated everything the Hasidus says about a Yid, that you can't explain what a Yid is. It's an ishama. He didn't draw the right conclusion, but he asked all the right questions. He didn't dot the I and cross the T. He didn't say, so being Jewish is transcendent. Being Jewish has an element that you can't make sense out of. Being Jewish is more than logic. But he led you to the water because he argued against any definition that's logical, that's explicable. And of course, any person who's learned Hasidus hears this argument every day. There's something about being Jewish that you cannot explain. So when you tie this together, that on the one hand you have the Jewishness that we have from Avraham Yitzhak and Yankiv, which has to do with virtue and righteousness and spirituality, and the Jewishness that we have from Matan Teirah, from Har Sinai, which has to do with being a nation of God, the worst Jew is a Jew. Finished. That's how it works. And the best Jew is no more than one. 
the, the fusion of these two ideas is the place where Vladimir Posner asks his question. And the answer is, you're right. Whatever it is that Hashem wanted, that God Almighty created and created His people, is really something that's impossible to understand. It's deeper, it's different, it's very, very special. And it's, it's beyond logic. And it's who we are, it's who we always were, who we are, will always be. We, of course, spend our entire lives kicking and screaming, <laughs> trying to make sense out of our own Jewishness, trying to put it in a box, trying to fix it, trying to control it, trying to manage it. But you can't, you just can't do it. So, uh, uh, having laid the foundation, having given you the groundwork, I move on to another point, which again, I think is... Uh, very, I think it's a good argument. What is a Jew? Ask our enemies. <laughs> Do you want to know what a Jew is? Ask our enemies. In the last century, the two greatest enemies of the Jews, and frankly, the two greatest enemies of all of mankind, but they picked on the Jews, were Stalin and Hitler. They both had a deep despise for Jewish people. But for opposite reasons. Um... I don't need to tell you that Hitler was out of his mind. <laughs> what everyone wants to figure out is how the Germans went along with him. It's really, the Germans, I was just in Germany, they, they, they're guilty forever. They can't believe how stupid they were. The smartest nation in the world. The most ed educated, intelligent. But I, I, I held myself back. He's got you. He's got you. He's got you. He's got you. He's got I'd like to know what crime I'm guilty of. No, no, you said he wanted to make a political comedy. It's not, I don't know. Called, the, the crime is called Shemana. I hear you, I hear you. Okay, I'm learning new things. If you read what Hitler said and wrote, you learn the following. In his words, Hitler hated Jewish people because he made humanity weak. Because we made humanity weak, yes. Why? Because we believe in kindness. We believe in goodness. We believe in looking after the sick and the poor and the underprivileged. Hitler was the only pure evolutionist. Hitler was a strict evolutionist. The laws of evolution require the strong to kill the weak. The survival of the fittest. Yes, why? Because if the strong preserve the weak, the weak weaken the strong, and they set evolution back. Hitler taught this to school children. To school children. It was the culture, it was the philosophy. Toughness and strength and competitiveness and murder was all part of creating a super race. That's what he believed. And his religion was evolution. We've evolved, and we've gotten this far because we, without any conscience, you know, ate our way to the top, right? Why are you here when your, the grandpapa or the other person not here? Because you killed him and ate his lunch.